Welcome again. This is Dr. Ali McGavin. And in this second part, we'll focus on analysis of multi-user systems. We have done the introduction, and then we'll focus on the analysis. We'll also touch upon some random access techniques, and we'll conclude with an example. The credit for some slides goes to Professor Hank. So let's take it from there. Let's do the analysis for the downlink for TDMA, FDMA, and CDMA. The diagram shows here the downlink where we have the transmitter, the base station, and the different users. So basically at the transmitter side, we're going to send signals for user one, signal for user two, signal for user three. So basically the signal is sum of X sub K, where X is a signal transmitted to user K. Now we remember that every signal for every user, we're going to transmit a sequence of bits, sequence of symbols. So shown in blue to make things easy, K represent the user and L represent the symbol. So we're sending symbol for user K, symbol number L, and we're summing for all different symbols. Now at the receiver side, what we get for user K, we're going to get the transmitted signal, of course, that goes to everybody because um, we're not going, it's a wireless, so what you send to all is going to be seen by all users. It's going to be affected by the channel H here, so a scaling factor alpha, K. The signal will be scaled depending on path loss, shadowing, and what have you. And then we also have noise added. So at the receiver side, we have the following form. For the, for the first user, we have R1, the received signal, alpha 1, and we have noise for the channel. We can replace S, of course, with its equivalent X for all users. And then also we can replace uh, X with its equivalent sequence, sequence of symbols. So we end up with two summations. One summation is for um, the users, another summation for the symbols. Similarly for R2, R3, but I did not try just to avoid uh, being crowded. So we have the transmitter model, we have the received signal model. What do we do at the receiver side? We're going to correlate the, output, the received signal, this double summation, with different symbols and see what we get. So for example, correlating with symbol L, that let's say you have binary, then you have two of them, you have a quaternary, then you have four of them, you want to correlate and find out which one of the signals is more, is more uh, probable. So at the output of the correlator, we get the received signal, that's everything here, correlated with a template. We multiply by the conjugate. So uh, if you open this up, if you multiply, because of these double summations, we get different terms and the noise. This is easy part. Then once you correlate, at the output of the correlator, we'll, be like, we'll get the filtered noise or the fixed noise. So it's not N anymore, but rather W, which is the result of user K and then symbol L. Similarly, this double summation, we'll split it into two parts. Okay, when we have L and K are the same, and when they are not the same, so we are just using different uh, summation terminology here. When they are not the same, which means we're looking at uh, different users, K does not equal to our intended user. So we have this term and here where we have uh, K equal to our user. So this is the, the term that we are looking for, the signal R1, for example, in this case. And this is the, ter the, uh, this is the impact of other users. So we can say that we have three terms we can just simplify this, assuming that this is normalized. We get alpha k times a k, so we receive the signal, but scaled by this channel, of course, which is what we want to, to look at. There will be, of course, MUI. MUI stands for multi-user interference. And then we have, of course, the filtered noise. So the model for the downlink is shown here. We're going to receive the intended signal. We're going to receive multi-user interference plus noise. Of course, if you're doing perfect TDMA or FDMA or CDMA with orthogonal codes, then of course we'll get zero interference. This term will cancel out. Over in real life, we cannot guarantee being 100% orthogonal due to synchronization issues and out of band emission. And of course, um, because of uh, synchronization again or uh, non orthogonal codes. We can, for the case of CDMA, we can define the cross correlation function. Okay, if you are using orthogonal or orthogonal, we can look at, um, of course, we can find the correlation 
and we get a measure of how, how the codes are correlated. That's for the downlink. Let's now try to see the uplink. For the case of uplink, now we can see that this diagram has changed now. Uplink, it means the arrows are going from the users to the transmitter. So uh, the transmitter will be sum of all different uh, symbols from user K. And at the receiver side, of course, we have to sum over all Ks. So this is going to be substituted here. Again, we have double summation. One is due to the users, and uh, of course, uh, we will have uh, X itself will be made of different symbols like we have here. So L and K. Again, I'm using colors to make things uh, relatively easier. So we have different delay for different users. Now, if you look at uh, the equations here, you can see that the received signal, once we receive at the base station, we will need to correlate. And then, of course, we correlate with the conjugate. Again, we'll have three separate terms. One is noise, one is the intended term, and one of is, of course, the multi-user term. Once more, the expression might look different in the, in the uplink and downlink case. If if they are um, if we are going to have uh, FDMA and perfect FDMA will get zero, for the TDMA will have also zero. Of, co of course, this requires timing, proper timing because you know that they have to arrive at the proper time for all the different users. For the uplink is different than the downlink. Downlink come from all the same source. But for the uplink, now um, for, for them to be uh, orthogonal, there must be some sort of synchronization done a priori. So that's the main difference between uplink and downlink. For example, for the case of direct sequence CDMA, there is always going to have uh, multi-user interference. And it's going to be harmful, of course, if we have one strong and one weak users. And if it turns out that the interferer is, is strong, our signal is weak under near-far conditions. What makes always we get multi-user interference is that those users are transmitting at different times. So if their codes are, are orthogonal, uh, the timing difference will make them non-orthogonal. So what to do? The base station here can use some multi-user detection techniques. Multi-user detection means, it's a, it's a course by itself. Multi-user detection means that I'm not going to detect one only, I will detect all of them at the same time. So even if I'm interested in user two, and user one is strong, I might start by decoding user one, just then subtract it as a, and then of course look for user two and so on. This is called multi-user detection. There are all types of parallel cancellation, serial cancellation, and different types of multi-user detection. Now for those systems we have covered, for multi-user systems, and because of the presence of interference and non-orthogonal um, multiplexing, we would like to look at the model again. We have the intended term. We also can have ISI, which is interference with intersymbol interference, if these symbols are not orthogonal. If these symbols extend in time or in frequency or in code, we also have multi user interference. So we have L and K. Those are two different uh, sources of interference. Of course, we have, we have also the noise. So let's color them here. We have uh, yellow, orange, flag, or brownish, and then we have the blue. So, what 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 is our performance metric? We can use the following, we can look at the signal to noise ratio, which we have been dealing with because we didn't have interference before. So we take this term, divide by that term, assuming this is equal to zero. And that's good for noise limited regimes. If the noise is the dominant factor, it's the limiting factor. And of course we can have the, not SNR, signal to noise ratio, we can have SINR, which is a signal to noise and interference ratio. That would replace the signal to noise ratio in error probabilities because now we are accounting also for the interference. So the interference appear like additional noise. And finally, we also have the signal to interference only in case we have interference limited regime, which means the performance is limited by the interference rather than the noise. Of course, that's, that would be more accurate the one in the middle. But if one of them is, is negligible, we can use the SNR or SIR. So you should be familiar with all three types. Now, for the case of random access, random access, 
it's different than multiple access I just want to give you an idea because we didn't cover networking much here for the random access you would hear about ad hoc and in the case of like Wi-Fi how do different users get into the channel what is special about Wi-Fi and, uh, and data uh, applications we might have some bursty traffic which means that data comes not in a continuous way but it comes in bursts and we can use models like Poisson uh, models for packet arrivals that's maybe beyond the scope just want to give you an idea about how when you use Wi-Fi different users use different channels so we have more users than channels of course because if the users are less than the channels there's no problem everyone would be assigned a channel and that's it the common protocols used is what we call the Aloha where we transmit as soon as the packet is ready so let's say we have users stations A, B, C and D so whenever you get uh, a, a packet to transmit this this is time and this represents a packet whenever we have a packet to transmit we get just transmit directly so we, we, we have slotted Aloha where we have channels stations and everyone will be transmitting now the problem with this is that we, we can have easily overlap even sometimes uh, the start of transmission is perfect but by the end another one is transmitting so it will destroy the entire packet so the solution to this is what we call slotted Aloha okay we transmit in the next slot as soon as the packet is ready so we are going to slot the time into okay if this is the time access we're going to have slot or slots but don't transmit in the middle just wait because if somebody is successful here then it will continue to be successful that's called slotted Aloha now the problem is that if the channel is busy then somebody is waiting there is if we have not large number of users there is a probability that all of them are waiting for the channel for the next slot so then we can use um, multiple access with the probability of transmission so I will wait with probability P to transmit so we can have carrier sense multiple access I will check the channel and if it's empty I will transmit but with the probability of P why because usually there could be more than one waiting to transmit so this is called resistant since until free then transmit with probability P so we have this is called carrier sense we have carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance where we try to avoid the collision so you hear about Aloha slotted Aloha we have carrier sense multiple access and carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance more about these protocols maybe would co be covered in other networking courses but with I think there's some link here to multiple access and uh, just to distinguish between multiple access FDMA, CDMA and TDMA and maybe space uh, division multiple access compared with random access techniques uh, which we use in networking so you, you get kind of protocol where you have to follow start and then assemble the frame look at the time wait this, that's the uh, the mechanism for to avoid the collision wait for a certain time so for uh, we have different protocols to follow okay so that's just in a nutshell uh, random access techniques for the case of TDMA we will conclude with an example TDMA and FDMA so let's I'll give an example I'd like to think about it let's say you are designing a system where we have downlink there is 250 megahertz bandwidth this bandwidth is divided into 125 channels in the frequency domain so we can we have sort of FDMA similarly also we have each channel each one of these will operate on TDMA so uh, real systems like GSM and others are complicated so we might be using more than one multiple access techniques it's not just TDMA and FDMA we can have a mix of, of the two so if each, each channel here is divided using TDMA and the slots contain eight different users for the type of communication the type of modulation used we use 16 QM and um, so each user sends with 16 QM and can use only one frequency at a given time so we'll be given a channel and then we have we're using 16 QM that's that's we have four symbols uh, per um, per uh, four bits per symbol that will help us of course in some calculations so then we know uh, something up, up to here we have just normal digital communication to introduce the wireless and back we are told that there's a maximum channel delay spread of 10 microseconds that's the data sent 
might have an echo up to 10 microseconds. The coherence time of the channel is 10 milliseconds. Now, if you are good in your background in wireless communication, you might see the impact of these on the division and what, what have you. So our task is to answer the following questions. How many users can be supported? What is the total data rate? What is the minimum guaranteed rates per user? And what is the maximum rate per user? Do we need equalization? And finally, how frequent training is, is needed? The last two questions, just to let you know, will be related to uh, the last information about the wireless channel. So please pause the video and give yourself five minutes to think about uh, how many users can be supported if we are dividing this way, how many uh, users can be supported in frequency channels and then every channel is divided into eight, so I'll leave it for you. Once you are ready with your calculations and sharing your answers, uh, I will move to the next slide. So let's take it on. The solution. We have uh, 125 channels, meaning 25 divided by one, uh, 250 megahertz divided by 125. That will give you 200 kilohertz per channel. That's the total bandwidth, and that's the division. Now also in time, the total data rate is 4 bits per symbol. And of course, we assume that the, the transmission rate is just equal to the bandwidth for simplicity. So 200 kilohertz shown in purple is again equal to the number of symbols. So the rate equal to the transmission. Okay, that's in, in, in passband communication. Now we have four bits per symbol. That's um, the number of uh, uh, the bandwidth given for, for the users. And then we need to multiply by 125. So that will give you the total number of channels. So every channel will, will allow this much of data. And of course we have 125, so uh, we get, or you can just multiply four by 25 megahertz. And that will give you 100, 100 megabits per second. Now each TDMA slot serves eight users. So uh, we have uh, 125 channels times eight. So the total number of users will be 1000 because the bandwidth is divided into 125 channels. At the same time, we have eight users per channel, so we get 1,000 users are supported. Remember that the rate per user, if the total rate is 100 megabits per second, and we have 1,000 users, you divide 100 megabits per second, divide by 1,000, and you get 100 kilobits per second, as we can see here. So 100 megabits per second, divide by 1,000, and you get uh, uh, 100 kilobits. So this, bullet explains how we got this number. If we assign a complete channel to a single user, of course, if we assign the entire channel in time domain, uh, there is no time division multiple access, we'll get, of course, 800 kilobits per second. We're going to get 800 kilobits per second. Since each channel has a bandwidth of 200 kilohertz, and the simple transmission time, as we mentioned, is going to be 1 over the transmission rate, the, tra the bandwidth. So this, if you divide 1 by 200 kilohertz, you get 5 microseconds. Now, it takes us 5 microseconds to transmit. And remember that the delay spread is 10 microseconds. So definitely, there are going to be inter simple interference because the echo is longer than the transmission given time. So I will send one symbol, another symbol, and this first one is still having some impact. So to avoid inter symbol interference, the solution to this is what we call equalization. We need to equalize the channel, work out how to make the effective delay limited. So instead of 10 microseconds, which is not equalized, the equalizer will look like a, will make the channel look like an impulse, uh, just like a delta. Of course, as much as we can. Then I leave it for you. That would be the end of it. Uh, how frequent training is required? Okay, go back to the information in the previous slide and see how much was given as the uh, coherence time. Okay, I hope that you gain out of this. That's uh, simply the end of multiple access, simple introduction to multiple access for wireless communications. We also have touched on uh, uh, the random access techniques. Please leave your comments, questions in the comment section. And thank you for being good listeners.